Chicago, and um, I'd like you, I'd like you to make it very visual and take your questions. So I'll make my short presentation very, very short. So this picture that you're seeing here has been uh, taken is the last picture of a news report which was made by France to the French public TV, state-owned public TV, on September 30, 2000. It's 10 years ago. Uh, it was. Okay, so it's a year before 9-11 and it's so important because uh, it really has changed the world. And what you're going to see is not uh, an hypothesis, but these are the conclusions of the demonstration which have been validated in courts of justice and in all the universities in the world where I've been invited. So I think it's very important to understand that this is a demonstration with experts' opinion. Uh, I did not discover this is a hoax. This was discovered by Germans, Israelis, and American researchers. And what I did is that I took the story uh, like almost eight years ago, like eight years ago. I tried to have it these things corrected, but it couldn't have it correct, been corrected. So this is why I provoked the French public TV and why they sued me for defamation. Um, we have limited time. Uh, because I'm flying after. So I will show you maybe 30% of the evidence in this presentation. If you have <coughs> questions afterwards, I will of course take all of them, uh, but please keep all of them for the end of the presentation. And if you want, we will be able, I have my computer, so we'll be able to go and look for some other films if you need uh, more uh, details. Before starting, I'd like to tell you one last thing. None of the documents that I'm um, uh, showing you here <coughs> have ever been contested by anyone. The French justice never contested the source, as well as the French too never contested that these documents are real. Okay, so let's take a look at it. My claim <coughs> is that 100% of the news report that you're going to see is staged. What I mean staged is non-professional actors, but actors. So let's take a look at it. Please, 50 seconds of lies. Quinze heures, heures, tout vient de basculer près de l'implantation de Netsarim dans la banque de Gaza. Les Palestiniens ont tiré à balles réelles, les Israéliens ripostent, ambulanciers, journalistes et simples passants sont pris entre deux feux. Ici, Jamal et son fils Mohamed sont la cible de tir venu de la position israélienne. Mohamed a 12 ans. Son père tente de le protéger. Il fait des signes. Mais une nouvelle rafale. Mohamed est mort. Et son père gravement blessé. Okay, so this is the last picture. Let's take a look at their version of the facts. First, they say that they were at the distance that the soldiers were at the distance of 80 meters. Then they say that the soldiers targeted them continuously for 45 minutes. Is there anyone here in this room who has already used the gun? Okay, so at a distance of 80 meters, a fixed target, I would say, like a half of the screen. How long does it take you to shoot it? One second, two seconds? So 45 minutes is more, more time than my presentation. So it's completely absurd. So I, what I want to tell you, what I'm trying just before going into the demonstration and the experts and everything is that I tell you, just with common sense, we could have understood at the beginning it was staged. And like everybody in the world, I was so brainwashed by the media that I real, uh, believed it was a real document. Then they said that the boy was shot and killed with three bullets and that the father got 12 bullets and was injured. Mm -hmm. When you took a, take a look at the picture, you, you just realize that despite the 15 bullets that went through their bodies, there is not a single drop of blood. Okay. Just common sense. So first, I'll show you how it has been exploited all over the world. Who are the main characters? Why friends to version of the fact is inconsistent? And your questions and my answers. So let's take a look. Okay. 
the exploitation. So first you had these kind of cartoons in the newspapers. Then you had something which was much more elaborated, postage stamps coming from all over the Muslim world, from Iran, Sudan, to Jordan, Egypt, Morocco, wherever. Then, remember, it's a year before 9-11, so Bin Laden used it to incite against the Jews, Israel, and the Western world. And this is part of his video clip. <laughs> Okay, the Minister of Health in Gaza is Mahdi Mohammed al -Dhar. Here is a huge building in Iran, so you can imagine the size of the poster. Daniel Pearl. Daniel Pearl, Daniel Pearl was killed to avenge the so-called death of Mohammed al -Dhar. You will see part of the video clip which was posted by the terrorists in Pakistan. You won't see the ugly scene, but you will see the, the justification of the killing. Der amerikanische Journalist Daniel Pearl war Jude. Seine Henker zwangen ihn, Israel als Kindermörder anzuprangern. Wenige Minuten später trennten sie ihm vor laufender Kamera den Kopf ab und stellten die Bilder ins Internet. On the left hand side here you see STO, it's Stop Killing Palestinian Children. And what you can see is that uh, the peacemaker Marwan Barghouti yeah. is using yeah. Stop Killing Palestinian Children. So from Pakistan to the so-called peace allies of Israel, you can see that all of them are using this blood type. Mm -hmm. Here is in Lebanon, you can see the size of this child, so you can imagine the size of this poster with the Hezbollah flag. And here is the most important monument now in the world. This is in Bamako, the capital of uh, Mali in Africa. And they have their main square, which is Place de l'Enfant Martyr de Palestine. Uh, I think it's very important to understand that this message, this lie, this blood libel has been taken everywhere in the world. You have schools, monuments, buildings. And this is why, this is the answer to the question that may come later on. Why should we come back on that? It's an old story, the people who die are dying. No, people are going to, are going to die again and continuously die because of this blood label, which is used and which became now the worst picture which has ever been created against the state of Israel, ever, since the creation of the state of Israel. There is no other picture. So who are the main characters? You have first Talal Abu Ahmad, the cameraman. He's an Arab cameraman who needs to work for CNN at the same time. When he filmed his material, he sent it to France 2 and CNN. CNN refused to air it and to edit the film because they said it doesn't look real. Mm -hmm. uh, we want some guarantees it's authentic. But France 2, uh, they didn't have this kind of uh, cautiousness. And you have Charles Andelli. He's a journalist who edited the film and who did the voiceover. He's a French-Israeli journalist. He made Aliyah 40 years ago. He's a Jew. And uh, he's a very, very respected figure in France. Just that you know, eight days ago exactly, he just published a book in France, eight days ago, which is An Enfant et Mort, A Child Was Killed, which is a 200 pages where my name appears 114 times, 114 times in 200 pages, uh, to justify his film and to say that it's not a book at all, that the Israelis really killed the boy. And uh, every day, on TV, radio, and newspaper in France for the last two weeks. You have had uh, shows, TV, radio, insulting me, telling me that I'm like a Holocaust denier, denying the death of a child. Just that you understand where we are now in France with this guy. You have to also know that he's a very well-connected guy in Israel, and he still got the full support of many Israeli authorities, mainly the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who are backing him for all what he did. Afterwards, I will read you the comment of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Israeli, of the Israel Ministry of Foreign Affairs spokesperson when I won the trial. What he said about the fact that I won the trial. Just that you understand uh, the situation, because this guy is a very, very powerful man in Israel. France too, it's the French state. So, you know, you have Voice of America and Voice of France. 
voice of France is truly France too. Uh, Charles and Berlin received the Legion of Honor last year from the French government. And when I asked him, but how come did you get, did you give them the, the Legion of Honor after what he did? And they told me that he's been working for us for 25 years. Because he's really an employee of the KDLC, the French State Department. And Jamal uh, Aldera, he's the father of the boy who claimed that he got 12 books. So, in order to demonstrate that it's a book, I will ask five questions. The first one is, what other scenes were filmed at Ned Daring Junction that day? Why? Because you have to understand, one of the strongest argumentation that we're getting from the other side is that, how can you imagine that they would stage a scene in the middle of such a war? So I'm going to show you that that day, at the same spot, there was no war. It was acting, just as they used to frame it. Uh, Richard Landers from Boston University, Hollywood, Palestinian Hollywood. So just take a look at it. Before showing you the, uh, some clips, I would like to show you where it happened. So here is the Israeli stronghold. Here is, you have the distance of 80 meters. You have an angle of 30 degrees. And here you have the wall with the barrel. And the boy and the father were here. And now what we're going to see are cameramen filming here in this direction. So they're filming the Israeli uh, stronghold. And on their back, they're having the, the barrel. You see? On the back, the barrel. On the front, the Israeli stronghold and the flag. <laughs> Just here. Take a look at this 
reaction doesn't isn't logical because he jumps in this direction, whereas he should the bullet was coming from this direction, so he should, he should be pushed towards the jeep. Okay, watch it again. Okay, look at the ambulance, the ambulance here. Okay, so they will drag him on the floor on the right leg, no blood. They will carry him here, no blood on the right leg. And they will put him on the stretcher, on the right leg, he doesn't complain. I told you two cameramen, I was wrong, there were a third one. The ambulance, the jeep, but this one was not so well positioned, but saying to him we can see that on the left hand side, the father and the boy are already waiting behind the barrel. So when they're filming this fake scene, and I could show you more and more details, you can see, for example, that when they're filming with the raw material that we got at the court, you can see that there are two guys smoking like this, playing with their ash of their cigarettes, the long version of the film. So it's completely absurd. So the first scene of France to News Report is, of course, not authentic. So what became of the bullets, and what was the source of the gunfire, the alleged gunfire? So I get a question. Have you ever heard of a journalist going to any human rights organization to testify or what, about what he filmed or what he wrote. Have you ever heard about that? No. That this man, the journalist, the cameraman, went to the Palestinian Center for Human Rights three days after it happened, and he testified. I spent approximately 27 minutes photographing the incident, which took place for 45 minutes. Four years. We've been begging for these 27 minutes. At the first trial, I couldn't get them. They refused to give them to me. I tried everything. But finally, at the appellate court trial, the judge went to France and said, look, wait a minute, there is a problem with you. You claim that you have 27 minutes of the incident. You pretend that you have, it's a real document. Bring them to the court. So what happened? The, the, trial, the, the, the trial was, was postponed. And the friends who brought the, the, the DVD and instead of bringing 27 minutes, they brought 18 minutes to the court. So they tampered with the evidence. And in these 18 minutes, there was some more ridiculous material and nothing to sustain their, uh, their accusations. So, and then he said, after I can confirm that the child was intentionally and in cold blood shot dead and his father was injured by the Israeli army. So he confirmed all that. A year later, he was interviewed by a German TV, and here is what he said. I never saw shooting in my life like this. Mm -hmm. 45 minutes shooting the boy. So 45 minutes shooting the boy. So now let's send to him again. There were many bullets, right? Coming out of them. Out of them. Yeah, there's some uh, uh, bullets hit the uh, but, but but that doesn't mean anything. Okay, look, look at the wall. There is a lot of police around the world. You know, I count it, 40. All the world, only 40. Okay, so 100, then 40. If you just think of 45 minutes of ring, 40, it's just a big wall like that. It's ridiculous, less than one per minute. But if you take a look at this wall, you have only eight bullet holes, less than one each five minutes. And if we had a ballistic expert who testified for us, 90 pages. This is the size of this bullet hole. Can you imagine if he had 12 of these bullet holes in his body? And if you look at the, at the shape of these round holes, it is the evidence that the shooting is perpendicular, not coming from the angle. Okay. And there is also something quite special, because the bullets should be coming from this direction, so like this. So he would have received 12 bullets in his body, and he stayed like that. No move at all. Completely <coughs> ridiculous. And of course, no blood. So now let's listen to Charles Anderlin, the big guy in France. All the witnesses, I talked to, uh, told me the shooting was coming from the direction or from the Israeli position itself. So, all the witnesses. At the trial, France 2 didn't bring any document to substantiate their claim. They didn't re respond to any of our accusations. The only thing is that they brought one letter of Jacques Chirac. At that time, he was a French president who said that Charles Andelin is a great journalist, very reliable, and written testimonials of other journalists who claimed that they were at the spot. I'd like you to read some of their sentences. 
So at the trial, this is what they brought. <coughs> Israeli soldiers were firing missiles. Mm -hmm. There was a plane was firing at them from overhead, of course. And there were helicopters, Israeli snipers firing anti-tank missiles. So all the Israeli army was focusing on the boy and the father and their bad shooters. You know. You've got to keep your story straight. Sorry? When you lie, you got to keep your story straight. Yeah. So, you see, it's absurd. More lies and more lies and more lies. And every time, and in the book that he has just published in France, and for those of you who read French, uh, you, can send me, uh, you can send me an email and I will send you a link when you can download it for free on the internet, his book, and you'll see he's lying and adding more and more lies. So, of course, no Israeli bullets were shot towards the altar. So now the two, last two questions. What about the father and what about the boy? So let's listen to the father. Zwölf Geschosse sind in meinen Körper eingedrungen. Mein Unterkörper war voller Schüsse und mein Arm. Twelve bullets, his lower body and his arm. Of course, his lower body and his arm. You can see here, lower body, full of bullets. No blood nowhere, but the day after, a cast with blood. Just ask any medical doctor in the world. He'll tell you that with, when you have an open wound, you don't put a cast on it because it makes sense. And here, so the day after, the blood is somewhere else, real red blood. So, but we have a problem with him, and we had a problem that we solved uh, year, years ago, is that underneath his cast and his bandage, he has some scars. So we had to find a justification for the scars. So first we, re we realized that the scars that he's showing on TV are not round scars like bullet wounds, but uh, 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 long, long, long like lines, scars on his body. So finally we found the expl explanation. In 1992, he was accused of being a collaborator of the Israelis by the Hamas. So they caught him and they stabbed him and they assaulted him with axes and knives. In 1994, his boss, because he used to work in Israel in the construction industry, paid for his surgery at, at Tel Shomer Hospital in Tel Aviv. So he had all the scars which are like this, and for years we've been saying to France, so bring the guy to any medical expert and he'll tell us if it looks like bullet wounds or uh, scars of knives and, uh, and scalpel. And here is a doctor that we found who, now, who treated the father uh, in 1994. לקחתי גידים באופן חופשי, זאת אומרת, ניתחתי אותם מהשרירים שלהם מכף רגל שמאל, והעברתי אותם לשריר שהיה עדיין פעיל בידו הימנית. כל זה, כמובן, זה משאיר צלקות. ולכאורה, הצלקות האלה, לפי ה... התמונות שג'מאל דורה מציב אותן כפיצי ירי של חיילי צה"ל לא יכולים להיות בשום פנים ואופן פצע ירי. לפני שיצאתי לתקשורת רציתי להיות בטוח שאני לא, לא טועה, התייעצתי עם אנשים שיודעים כירורגיית כף יד, שיודעים איך נראה צלקת מזה שעוסקים בזה במשך כ-40 שנה, וכולם מסכימים כמוני, הצלקות הללו שג'מאל אדומה מציג כצלקות של פיצי ירי, הן צלקות של חתך, או של סכין כירורגי, או של גרזן, או סכין כנשק. That you know because we are now in, a, in the law school, this man has been sued for what he said. Guess by who? By the father. The father has just sued him because he was also interviewed in a French Jewish newspaper, weekly. Of course, can you imagine the guy with the Jamal Adar with the Jewish newspaper weekly in Gaza every week? Of course. It's absurd. The story is that Charles and Dolin. Try, he's really trying to protect his <coughs> blood libel. So as France who doesn't want to go to court against me anymore because they know that they would lose, so he found the father to sue his daughter. So just that you understand the madness of the story. 
And the guy, and this doctor, I'm sorry to tell you, is a hero in Israel because he he had so many uh, medals from the war that he went through. So of course the father was not shot uh, in front of France to camera. Now let's come to the main character, the boy. So remember, I told you that the 27 minutes of the raw material. Finally, we only got to 18, but in these 18 minutes, there is something very, very interesting. These are the 10 seconds after he died. Died. So let's take a look. Listen to the machine gun noise. It always makes it more uh, real. Look at the elbow. Look at the face of the father. <coughs> look at his foot. So what happened? The boy rose his elbow, took a look at the cameraman, puts it down, the father is smiling, down, the foot is up, dust, noise. According to Charles Underlin, this is the agony of the kid, just so you understand how they go to cover their lives. So let's listen to the father now. The first bullet hit him in the right knee. Okay. Hit in the right knee, remember, right knee. It's very important. And Mohammed? Uh, Mohammed <coughs> wurde zuerst am rechten Bein getroffen. Right leg, right knee. Und das zweite Geschoss trat aus dem Rücken aus. Ich glaube, es waren insgesamt drei Schüsse. So, right knee, right leg, it's okay. And one bullet came out, and maybe a third bullet. Let's listen to Charles and Ali. We got uh, the pictures of Mohammed that do us body in the morgue of uh, the Shifa hospital. The wounds look to me consistent with the shooting that happened that day. The kid was not shot from the back. The wound in the back is an exit wound. Okay, so what you're seeing here is that he's talking about the morgue, exit wound on the back, so he confirmed that the bullet came out. As you all know, Gaza is a dangerous place where some kids die. And they really have pictures from the morgue. So you're going to see ugly pictures from the morgue. But remember, we were talking about the right knee. Listen to them precisely. Following the examination, it was clear that the bullet entered the body from the front and from above. The bullet entered the body in the abdomen and exited the body here. This wound was fatal. The second injury lies just beneath the chest, and the bullet exited through the left hip bone. This wound was also fatal because it shredded major blood vessels. The third injury in the left leg was relatively harmless. So, you realize, left leg. So, two bullets came in and went out. Right knee, now left leg. So, there is a problem. Maybe we're not talking about the same guy. Maybe this doctor treated someone who was not the boy who was on the scene. You remember we said two bullets which came in and went out with lots of blood. What you can see at the, after the last picture is that there is no blood here in the back, no blood on the wall, nowhere. Of course, the foot is out. Here is a real picture of someone who really got a bullet which came out of his back. Here is what it should look like. When you compare, no blood, no flesh, nowhere. So let's listen to the story about the wounds, the injuries of Muhammad according to the doctor. Uh, und was wissen wir über Mohammeds Verletzungen? In zweiten Aussagen zufolge kann der Krankenwagen mit Mohammed und Jamal al dura frühestens gegen halb vier hier im Shifa Krankenhaus in Gaza angekommen sein. Der diensthabende Arzt erinnert sich auch an die Einlieferung eines toten Kindes, aber nicht um halb vier. Es war gegen zehn Uhr. Ich war in der Intensivstation der Notaufnahme für die Schwerverletzten. Zeitgleich, innerhalb einer Minute, wurden zwei Personen eingeliefert. Eine war ein Kind. Hinterher erfuhr ich, dass es Mohammed Jamal al dura war. Um 10 Uhr will Dr. Tawil Mohammed al dura untersucht haben. Das aber kann nicht sein, denn da waren Vater und Sohn noch gar nicht an der Kreuzung und die Schießerei begann erst gegen 14 Uhr. 
Okay? So, you have a dead boy who arrives at 10 in the morning, and you have a scene which is filmed at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. So you cannot be dead at 10 and alive at 3 to be killed at 3.45. So there is a question. You have different wounds. The timing doesn't work. So we have a real question, which is whether, in fact, two boys. That's the real question. And the answer to this question is coming here now. We had a biometrician you know, who compares the face, and he compares the face of the boy at the morgue, then the face of the boy at the funerals, and then the face of the boy filmed in France to the French news report. So let's listen to it. Um eine Antwort auf diese Frage zu finden, wenden wir uns an einen der führenden Experten weltweit. Kurt Kindermann ist Gerichtsgutachter für biometrische Gesichtsvergleiche. Ihm legen wir alle Bilder vor, die Mohammed al dura zeigen sollen. Die Bilder wurden, die Gesichter wurden vermessen und dann untereinander in diesem biometrisch mathematischen Gesichtsvergleich noch einmal miteinander verglichen. Bei der Beerdigung gehe ich davon aus, dass es der äh, Junge ist, der auch diese äußerst markante Verletzung im linken Augenbrauenbereich hat. Denn diese Verletzung ist deutlich auf dem Obduktionsbild zu sehen und es schaut deutlich auf dem Beerdigungsbild zu sehen. Die ist nicht erkennbar auf dem Bild der eigentlich von dem Krankenhaus. Auch weitere Merkmale sprechen dafür, dass es sich bei dem obduzierten Kind nicht um Mohammed al dura handelt. Hier sieht man ja, dass die Augenbrauen in den Bogen verlaufen und hier sieht man, dass die flach nach oben nach hinten verlaufen. Okay, so you can see that these are different kids. So he was not shot in the children's uh, family. And I would like to show you the last seconds of friends to Rotorial. You remember you saw 10, 10 following seconds when he raised his elbow? Let's look the third, the three last seconds. Just afterwards. This is the end when the boy raised his elbow, put it down. Where are they? Two seconds later, they're not here. So we know that the guy had enough battery to film afterwards. See, he could have filmed the evacuation. He didn't film. He claimed in other interviews that the boy and the father stayed there for 15 to 20 minutes bleeding. They also claimed that none of the bullets stayed in their body, that they were transferred by the, by the bullets. Who came and cleaned the wall just afterwards? 15 bullets. Quite strange. So it's a hoax, and it has not been agreed. Before just moving forward and uh, concluding, I would like to ask in this room if there are any person who does not believe it's a hoax. I have no problem with answering this question, but I would like just to know if there is someone who doesn't believe it's a hoax. Okay. So just to conclude, why we can see it's a hoax is that you can see two guys. You receive 15 bullets, not a single drop of blood. You have all the ballistics. You have a dead boy who raises his elbow, takes a look at the camera. And then you have monuments like this all over the world, uh, which are really inciting. And we have two decisions of the French, of French Court of Justice. The first as a defendant, and the other one as an accusator. And here it is. If you have any questions, and if you want to receive some updates, and if you want to receive the book in French or anything, just send me an email. I'll put you on my friend's mailing list. And uh, you'll receive from time to time, maybe once a month, maybe once every two months. It depends. When something new is coming, uh, I'll send you it back. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you Following, I'm going to read a uh, quote from Igal Palmor, who's spokesperson. Following
quoting the most recent verdict, Egal Palmar, the spokesperson, when I won the trial. The spokesperson for the Israeli foreign ministry said Kassanti was a private individual and that no one in the Israeli government asked him to take on this battle against France. Therefore, Kassanti had no right to demand Israel to come to his aid. I never asked any help. I just said, when the guy is still uh, lying about Israel, he's publishing a book. He's uh, going on the media saying that Israel has killed the children. They should just deny and say it's a hoax. You know, just, I'm not asking them any help. I never asked them any money, anything. I just did it on my own. Then he said, uh, all calls on the Israel government to come and save him are out of place. He was summoned to court because of a complaint of the French television channel. I don't see where there is room for the Israel government to, Israeli government to get involved. He also said, uh, the government, he said, did not have an official stand as to what really happened on September 30 to 7 at Metering and sees the issue as an internal French affair, not Israeli. Um, and he said that fighting for the truth would be, from a, from, a stand point, from a PR standpoint, this would be totally counterproductive. So this was just after I won the trial. I was so unhappy that I went with comments on the press. And then he refused to be quoted officially, so he's a, an, an anonymous source at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but I know from the journals that he's the guy. And he says, uh, Cassanti has taken this on a life mission and sees everything that happened there as kind of a conspiracy. This is exactly what they're, and they're only saying that I'm a conspiracy series. That's true. Okay. He's very outspoken against the ministry, but we are not going to go into any kind of debate with him. I'm not uh, outspoken against, I'm just asking them, what are you doing? Are you defending your state, or are you just uh, sitting on your seat and making friends with friends to journalists? And um, he said, um, from an advocacy and PR point of view, it doesn't help any of us of to keep getting into this, even if some court determined determine it was a hoax. Would, would the Arab world believe it? They'll just say it's a conspiracy. We should leave it be and let bygones be bygones. So I think it's completely absurd because for for centuries, for millenaries, the Jews have been killed because of lies. You know, we were killing children to take their blood. We were killing, uh, we were poisoning their will. Everything, all the blood libel that we had for centuries. And I think that each generation gets his uh, share of blood libel, and we have to debunk them and reveal the truth. And uh, well, I think uh, so here. What is Paul Moore's rank at the ministry? Spokesperson. He's a very high spokesperson. Spokesperson at the foreign ministry. And I think he's the he's like Crowley at the State Department. Well, I don't know. Somebody um, tells me. Yeah, but he's the someone you, that you often see on TV. I thought I had followed this pretty closely when it happened. I remember a German film crew that had, after the event, had uh, come out with the conclusion that the shots yeah. came from the. Okay, so this was. Side. You're right. So this, this was. Okay. I interrupt. Sorry to interrupt. Can I answer? Oh, please. Okay. So this was the film, the first story which attracted my attention in 2002. A German TV came and said, look, the boy was not killed by the Israeli, but by the Arabs. I was shocked. I looked at it, it was impressive. So I went to the friends, you know, I used to be a stockbroker. I mean, I, I, sorry, I, I forgot to correct you, I'm not a journalist at all. I don't, we, I, I, and I wouldn't like to be part of this uh, corporation. <laughs> uh, so uh, I used to be a stockbroker, so you had nothing to do with this. And when I saw the film, I, because of my business uh, background, I had many connections with the business world, uh, leaders of it. So I went to the head of the TV channel. It's a whole, I mean, no, it's not a whole. So Israeli didn't kill the boy, you know, you should correct it. Oh, yes. Forget about it. We don't care when you're not, it's nothing. You're not telling the truth. Then when I came later on with conclusions, at the end of 2002, from the Israeli scientist, Nahum Sha'af, that it was a hoax, I was shocked. And then I said, look, now it's not only you have to deny the shooting came from the Israeli, you have to say it's a hoax. Then they say, we don't talk to you because we don't talk to, we don't talk to Holocaust deniers. Okay, so I had to fight, to fight, to fight, to fight. And then I came to the Germans um, in 2006. I went to see them and said, look, sorry, but uh, uh, you made a mistake. You believe that the, the kid was uh, killed by the Arabs, but he was not killed at all. So then they laughed at me and said, oh, oh, oh. Okay, go back, go back to stock brokerage and the uh, where journalist. Then I traveled again to Frankfurt and said, I'm sorry, you're wrong. And then I met for him again at the demonstration. And he said, well, it's 
express you. So I said, okay, now we will follow you uh, for your, the next steps of your trial because we'd like to, we're interested in, in following this. And they just had uh, a year ago, a year and a half ago, they made a second documentary when out they confirmed that it's a hoax. And I will give the, I have the, the videotape of it. If you want, it's in German with English subtitles. And I'll give you Steve the, the copy of it. And you can uh, do whatever you want with it. Here it is. And is that the one that you, we saw a clip from? Exactly, yes. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. Are you, are you planning to sue Enderlin over his new book? No. No. And uh, not because I don't want, but because I've studied the book. And uh, I don't see any room for suing him. And I don't think, so, you know, the legal things, it's hard to say here in the law school, but law is important, but we're not going into law now, you know. The law for me was just, the trial was just for me a tool to create a debate, because they wouldn't engage in any debate with me. Now the debate is not a little legal, because you know what? Now they, they brought the, the trial, to the, the, the case to the Supreme Court in France, called the cassation. They will rule only on technicalities. Let's say they say, well, the, the laws which were used by the judges on the Court of Appeal aren't right, so we break the verdict, and we, you go back to the appellate court. And I could lose in the appellate court, you don't know what's happening. Will it change the story if I lose the trial? No. Because the trial was not, is it a real document or a fake document? The trial was about, does Carstanti have the right to say this without being a defamer? You understand? It just, not the truth or falsity of the incident. Yeah, not the truth or the falsity of the incident. So I will not sue him because there is, it's not a legal story. And now, you know, it's a problem because I went to Sarkozy's office, I went to, the, his, I went to his Rahm Emanuel. He has a Rami Emanuel, his name is Claude Guillaume, he's not a Jew, but he's a Rami Emanuel. And uh, the guy told me, oh, you know, for us it's very difficult to deal with it because it's, uh, it's under, uh, it's under just, it's a, it's a judicial case where we cannot be involved. No, it's not true, you know. So for me, the best thing would be to close the judicial case and not go to the, to the experts. Yes, Steve? I just wanted to tell people that in the decision, I think it's the appellate decision that you have in the materials, but it may have been the, the trial court decision, but they specifically say, for example, that a number of the uh, sources that seem to contradict the France 2 broadcast are not, they're not going to consider that, because since they weren't known to Mr. Cassetti Car to, to at the time that he made his statements, they came out afterwards, they're not relevant to the question whether he defamed, because whether he could, maybe somebody today could say that it's true, or could say that, could easily say, could say the same thing and not be defamatory, but since that, those facts weren't available at the time, they're not going to consider them in terms of whether he had good faith and so on. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you know what, let's say something, I'm going to give you an example. Let's say tomorrow, France 2 goes on TV and says, you know, Carsanti was right, it's a hoax, and we apologize. Stephen, it's for you too. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I said, let's say uh, France 2 goes on TV tomorrow and says, it's a hoax, we agree, we apologize to the whole world, Cassanti was right. Okay? Yeah. This is what's happening, let's say tomorrow. But I could lose, still lose on the appellate trial. Mm -hmm. Because if I lose at that, because it would say, yeah, but at the time when he made his accusation, he didn't have the, uh, uh, the, uh, the the acknowledgement of friends that was a means. Yeah. I'd like to return to the point uh, that you were examining about the uh, 12 wounds to the body of the father. Um, none of the pictures showed the wounds without dressing. Yeah, look, as I in said. In addition, there's a kind of a multiple part question. Um, yeah, but it, it, I, I will not be able to deal with multiple parts because I will not remember just that. You know, no, because I'm sorry. Just like, you know, it's a limited time. If you want, I can go and look into my computer if you want to see the wounds. If you want to see the wounds, I have it. Well, that's what I was going to say. That's the other part of it. You did show the <coughs> wounds, which are the long striped uh, scars. And you had testimony from the doctor about what these scars represented in terms of the type of instrument that created it, not being bullets. Was his body ever examined in the other parts, his arm? And no, because he refused. And so on? But it, you did know, you ever see the skin itself there? No, but he refused. I mean, we have seen the, the pictures he has been showing uh, in the film, but he always right. refused to have experts. <coughs> you know, the French Jewish Umbrella Organization, 
uh, made in, went into a big argument with friends too, because they now support me. And they now support me, and they went and they said, look, uh, we don't know we have an investigation, so the first step is to bring the father to Paris to have his scars analyzed. They never brought it. And they claimed that the Israeli wouldn't let him out, and we had the authorization from the defense minister that he could get out of the mm -hmm. Sorry, and yet, was the other I'm Yeah, sorry. so the last part of that is then, um, um, isn't it relatively easy to determine that the age of the, of the scars, aside from their shape, the scars are much older yeah, than a fresh bullet wound? Yeah, but you need to have the guy who admits to be analyzed. He lives in, in Hamas land. He lives in Gaza. He doesn't live here. You know, you can you cannot take a... So no one's ever had under examination the actual so-called bullet wounds that were covered by the cast and the blood and the... Yeah, and you've, never, you've never seen it. Well, we've seen them on the field. We couldn't... I mean, and first, I'm not an expert. No, but it's covered on the film. No, we but didn't yeah, see I told you, we have, we have a film where the father is under cover. He shows his, uh, his legs, his arms, and we can see that the scars are not the scars from bullet wounds. Oh, so you saw scars in the areas where he claimed the bullet wounds. Yeah, it's like a uh, scalpel and knives. Right. Yeah. Have there been any sightings of the boy since? Any sightings of the boy? We mean what? the boy been seen? Well, some people claim that he's uh, selling fruits in the market of Gaza. It would be easier, but no, we don't have, I mean, I don't have any, uh, and even if you bring, you know what, let's say, okay, I bring you in the room now, Muhammad al Dara, I'm 22 years old, you know, I've been studying in Chicago to, that, to be undercover, it was too dangerous for me in Gaza, they would have killed me. What, 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 would they believe you? Of course not, they would say, no, it's an Arabic guy who looks like, but he's not him, because no, I'm if just wondering if there actually been, like, reports that he's still walking some people are saying that, but I don't, um, I mean, it doesn't make sense. And if people can believe that with 15 bullets, it's normal that you don't have blood, they won't believe you if you bring someone uh, 10 years later. And I'll tell you something, maybe he died a week, an hour, a year later, 10 years later, I don't know. Because it's a dangerous place, and he really, could be really a target for them. But my job stops at the end of France to, to France to film. At the end of the film, he's alive. That's the end of my job. Since the Israeli soldiers were not shooting, one would expect that they would want um, their, the Israeli government agencies to support them, that, that they did not do any shooting at, at the, these civilians. This is why I suggest to you ask Why would the Israeli Ministry of, of, of the why? Foreign Affairs uh, join with these journalists in extending this hope? Look, four years ago I came across the Israeli ambassador, the new Israeli ambassador to Paris in a cocktail party. I came to say hello. I stayed like that. He refused to shake my hand. I said, really like that. I was with my wife. I was ashamed, you know. He refused to shake my hand. Why? Right. Because he's a friend of Charles and Lily. He's a friend of the guy who met the brother. You have to understand, this guy is a very, very uh, connected guy in Israel. And two years later, when I won the trial, he just asked for a meeting with me at the Israeli embassy. I was invited. Oh, no, I know he's... You know, uh, last June when I won the second trial, he, he congratulated me. Oh, Philippe, fantastic, you won the trial, great, you know. So, you know, this man is connected. He had, I, you know what, next week you're going to have someone from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. You know, the, this file is on the computer here. So you can, you can keep it and transfer it to him. Just ask him, ask him, why don't you do your work? Why don't you clean the good name of the State of Israel? It's easy, you know. You've been defamed by so many media hoaxes during the last 10 years. This is one that you can debunk. They're not doing this. Yes? You mentioned the father has filed a suit against the Israeli doctor. Yeah. Number one, is that suit filed in France? Yes. And number two, will he now be obligated no. uh, to, 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 to provide a no. medical examination? No. Oh, you want, something, you want to hear something worse? There is only one doctor in the world who testified and who said that the father really got 12 bullets. I'm going to give you his name. Maybe you know his name. His name is Rafi Valden. Have you heard of Rafi Valden? His wife is Zvia Valden. And before, she was named Zvia Perez. She's a daughter of Shimon Perez. So the son-in-law of Shimon Perez made a false testimonial to defend the blood libel. And he's also the personal doctor of Shimon Perez. So what I'm telling you is that Charles Amelie is really well connected in Israel. He's really well connected. The head of the state, the president of the state, even if it's not the prime minister, 
His son-in-law testifies in favor of the blood label. He's a regular medical doctor where? In Israel. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm sorry. There. In the United States, if someone sues someone here, they have to come into court. I think the last question was, won't the father of Muhammad Abdurra have to go to France? Won't he be subject to being um, examined by independent doctors as <coughs> happened here in the United States? We have different legal systems, and in any country in the world, it won't work like France, which is becoming now, like, in this case, like North Korea. You know, the news don't enter the country. I mean, I'm traveling all over the world. I've been everywhere in the world, from India to South Africa to Turkey, everywhere. Everybody knows the truth. But if I want to sue you in France, you you're can sue me. I don't have to go to France. No, ever? you don't have to go to France ever. No, and especially if you're a poor little Palestinian living in Gaza, living in the blockade, you cannot leave the country because the Israelis are torturing your, your population, and you cannot leave the country because the Israelis are uh, are uh, keeping you like in a ghetto. That's very easy. The, the lawyer will plead like that, and the, ju the judges will cry. Can I ask one more question? Um, I'm, I'm not really sure of what you actually said that forms the basis of a defamation lawsuit. Here in the United States, I can call you a jerk, an idiot, a fool, you know, and none of that is the basis for a lawsuit. What is it exactly? That well, first, you have to understand we, we have different legal. I know, legal I know. Standard. I just said this is a blood libel. This is a hoax. This was fabricated. This is a must. Uh, but you didn't say that it was fabricated by Charles Enderlin. I said that he was manipulated by his cameraman, that he was duped, and that he duped us. That's it. That's it. That's it. And then on the other trial, when I won the trial, they made a, a 52 minutes documentary. Part of it was about 9-11 deniers. And part of it was about me. And they said, you see, in America, you have uh, rabid and pessimists who are denying the 9-11. And in France, we have uh, rabid, uh, crazy extremist Zionists uh, who are denying the death of the child. And for this, I sued them, and I won.